Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 76 of the Ortho Eval Pal podcast. I am your host, Paul Marquis, and do we have a treat for you today? Um, I have the, the, the great pleasure of being able to interview Dr. Ebony Rio, who is a tendinopathy specialist, and uh, will be talking to us today about you know, evaluating tendinopathy, how do we treat it? We'll talk about some of the research and literature that she's working on and um, probably give you some pearls, you know, that you can take to the office or clinic the next day so that um, you can you can really start to better treat your patient uh, with a, probably a different philosophy, certainly one that I uh, truly enjoy uh, working with. But before we get started, I'd like to take just a few seconds to hear a word from our sponsor. Hello and welcome back and welcome Ebony to our show. I really thank you for taking the time to, to join us today. Oh, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm absolutely thrilled to be on. Well, I'll tell you, um, you know, there's so much information that we could go through here and it could take us hours. And, and uh, you know, we were talking before the show started and we are obviously both super passionate about what we do, you know, getting people better and working with patients. I've been doing this for 26 years and I just absolutely love doing what I do. Um, I come to work every morning excited about coming to work and I can tell by talking to you that, uh, you know, you're really the same type of person that I am. Absolutely. Absolutely. We we're saying that we, uh, we both choose to still treat patients because we love it. Absolutely. So the, the first thing I'd like to do is just kind of, if we can, in a nutshell, just go back to the basics and let's try to talk to people about what the difference is between tendinitis and tendinopathy and why that makes such a difference by, by identifying the difference between the two. What a great place to start. So there's a couple of different ways to attack this. And I think the first one is to understand that the pathology of tendon injury is really complex. So the name tendinopathy was recognition that we really don't have a very good idea of what's going on at a tendon level. And that's actually true of a lot of different musculoskeletal um, injuries. We're learning more and more that there's actually, you know, it's far more complex than we thought. Now, from a clinical perspective, and this is what I feel really passionately about, I think the term um, tendinopathy is is fantastic because you can explain to people that it's about pain and, and dysfunction and that's what they care about. They care about their function, they care about their pain. The problem with a label like tendinitis is you know yourself or if you speak to any of your um, your family members or friends, words are really powerful. So if you say to someone, um, you know, you have tendinitis, they, they think it's inflamed and they think they need really passive strategies like rest and ice and, and anti-inflammatories. And we know that those treatments are ineffective. So the problem with not catching um, people and, and explaining um, that it's not tendinitis is you'll have a really hard time selling an exercise program if they think it's inflamed. They'll think that you're mad, that you're trying to get them to exercise with an inflamed tendon and the same is true of tendon tear so we really have to watch our language because there's great evidence that we we can't diagnose a tear in lower limb tendinopathies accurately that they present um, on imaging the same as tendinopathy but if someone thinks it's torn they're certainly not going to load it so my first clinical tip would be don't let anyone get away with using the term tendinitis make sure not gps not patients no one Right. So um, if, if you tell a patient, well, you know, this isn't an inflammatory problem, there isn't active inflammation. We know they've done biologic studies of, of the tissue to find that there's no active inflammation. The patient will ask you, so what is causing the pain? Ah, uh, that's such a great question. And I launched into a very scientific response one day to one of my patients. And he said, have you tried Googling it? And I said, it's not just me that doesn't know what causes tendon pain, it's, it's actually everyone. So we don't know the nociceptive driver. So we know that when you have pain, that's when um, a certain, um, lots of certain regions of your brain all light up at the same time. So that's true of, of pain, that's true of tendon pain, that's true of smelling fresh bread. You have this neuro tag. But what we don't know very much about is the driver from the tendon. We don't know what's happening at a tendon level. But actually, that's the same in osteoarthritis. That's the same in patellofemoral pain. We actually don't know the nociceptive driver. So um, I'm really honest with my patients. We don't know what causes tendon pain. It appears to have a driver from your tendon because it's 
it's really closely linked with load and um, it has lots of phenomena that you would associate with it being a nociceptive condition. But I'm really honest with people, we we don't know the driver and classic inflammation is, is not a, a key clinical component. There's some inflammatory kind of cytokines and cells that communicate, but I tell my patients, honestly, leave that for the researchers to debate because it doesn't help us at the moment clinically. Right. So would you say that it's it's safe to say that things like iontophoresis and, uh, and phonophoresis injections, anti-inflammatory medications, non-steroidals are pretty much not going to be very beneficial for these people who have tendinopathy? Yeah, that, that you know, as a broad um, sweeping statement is, is true. Ionto doesn't give us as much as we would like, even when we have um, an irritation of the sheath on the outside of the tendon. And again, we've always called that paratendinitis, but we're learning now we, we know less and less about the paratendon and that process. So that's not as effective in terms of um, the anti inflams You know, some people can report a, a little bit of benefit because we know some of those medications do cross the blood-brain barrier, but it's certainly not going to be the biggest tool in our box by any means. In terms of a, a cortisone injection, there's good evidence in the elbow that you have good short-term outcomes, but your longer-term outcomes aren't as good. And so, you know, you want your patient to buy in and you want to play the long game for their function. You want to really improve them over the long term. So we do have these short-term strategies. And I know that a lot of athletes um, do use some of these strategies from time to time, but they just shouldn't represent, sorry, <clears throat> a big part of our toolkit. Great. Now, um, you know, I, I've been listening to a lot of your uh, your uh, information and, and YouTube videos and things like that. You talk about neuroplasticity. Can you talk a little bit about what that means? And uh, also, if you could throw in a little, little bit about, you know, what you're doing for research right now in regards to neuroplasticity and, and tendinopathy and loading and that type of thing. Absolutely. So um, this is a great quote from Professor Laura Mosley we are bioplastic. So basically every single cell in your body is capable of change till the day you die, which is so exciting. So I teach my patients that, that you have so much capacity. Now, what we see in terms of bioplasticity in tendinopathy is it's a great example of adaptation at every level. So Sean Docking's done some fantastic work demonstrating that um, we see this tendon adaptation. So if people have pathology in their tendon or they have changes in their tendon associated with load, what we see is that those people have thicker Achilles and patella tendons. And so majority of people actually adapt, which is like, um, you know, a car that gets more tread on its tyres the more you drive it. You know, that's so exciting. We can say to people, look at your big fat tendon. Instead of people being worried about their um their pathology or their imaging and they're worried about a, an increase in AP diameter, you celebrate it. So, you know, that's biopsychosocial, you celebrate it. Look at your wonderful adaptation. So there's bioplasticity at a tendon level. Then we have a great opportunity to enhance bioplasticity and neuroplasticity as part of our rehab. So what I mean by that is we've done some research in the patella tendon, but there's also some stuff in the elbow and the shoulder, which shows that when you have tendon pain, you actually have changes to the way your brain um, controls that, that muscle action, that joint action. So every, every action you do is a balance between excitability and inhibition. And that happens in the brain and the spinal cord and in the periphery. And so that excitability can be thought of like the accelerator of a car and the inhibition can be like the brake. So every time you do something, you have a balance between those things. In people with, and I'll talk about our research, in people with patella tendinopathy, they had changes to both their accelerator and their brake. So when I, when I found this, and this was not my hypothesis, I was wrong in my very first study of what I hypothesized I would see, which is kind of exciting. What I looked at was, well, how well does physio and rehabilitation address the brain and spinal cord. So we know that we need load, but do we have any strategies that change our brake and our accelerator? So that's that's what um, neuroplasticity, that's what we need to get better at as clinicians is considering our, our whole person and what strategies we have 
to try and prevent recurrence and some of those issues that make tendinopathy really challenging to treat. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, and, and so we talk a little bit about, you know, treating folks and, and load. If we're not going to be doing soft tissue work and passive modalities and uh, those types of things for treating tendinopathy, can you talk a little bit about load and, and how that's important in this situation and, and how do we load? Let, let's, let's take the patella tendon, for example. Um, if you could explain a little bit about you know, the difference between concentric, eccentric, isometric, uh, and when those are important, that'd be great. Fantastic. So the first thing is that understanding how tendons see load is critical because that actually helps you from your differential diagnosis right through to end-stage rehab. So I want everyone listening to think like a tendon for five minutes or the rest of their lives. So what I want you to think of as a tendon is you can see four different types of load. I'll put that in the camera. So the first type of load is anything that's fast for that tendon. So anything where you're asking that tendon to store energy and release it like a spring. So if we talk about the patella tendon, that can happen in two ways. The common one we think of is jumping. But another one that you may not um, necessarily um, think of straight away is really fast change of direction, like a tennis athlete at the net when they're lunging. So they really lunge to reach a ball and then quickly um, change direction back the other way. So that explains why we can see patella tendinopathy in our volleyball athletes that can jump up to 300 times a session, but also in basketball athletes that don't really jump as much as you think, but do tons of fast change of direction, particularly, you know, in, in quarter court. So that's our high patella tendon load. That's energy storage load. That's elastic load. And so automatically I want everyone's antenna to be up if they have someone with anterior knee pain, who's a runner because that's not high patella tendon load. So if you understand load or a cyclist, if you understand load, you can really use that concept from the first words that um, your patients are uttering about what aggravates their pain or how this came on. So that's our first load, that's energy storage load. Then our second load is our compression. So compression is where the tendon is kind of squashed against a bony prominence. And so a really easy one to think about is the Achilles tendon down at the calcaneus when someone's in dorsiflexion. And that's why people with insertional Achilles tendinopathy are aggravated by eccentrics off a step because of the compression, but equally it's why they're eased when you give them a great big heel raise and take them out of that compression because that's a really provocative load. Now, our third load is a combination of our energy storage and our compression. So that would be like our, our fast change direction for the Achilles tendon. So, so pushing off and changing direction um, where you drop into dorsiflexion, but you spring back um, the other way. Um, the key thing about combination loads is they're the most challenging for tendons, but it's also what we've got to get people back to. That's predominantly how we use our tendons with the, the, the bony kind of fulcrum. And the, the fourth load is a load that I want you to be aware of because it points to differential diagnosis. So, for example, that's the person with Achilles region pain and you say to them, what did you do? And they say, oh, I got a new bike. And what happened is they, they spent lots of um, – lots of time dropping off the back of the pedal, going into repeated plantar flexion and dorsiflexion, or they started swimming with flippers and they're doing lots of repeated plantar flexion and dorsiflexion. So lots of movement load, lots of friction load, shear load, but it's not energy storage. And that's critical because that irritates the surrounding structures, that irritates your paratendon, your sheath. And the reason why all this is important is if someone came to me with Achilles region pain and I thought it's mid-substance Achilles tendinopathy and I give them concentric, eccentric, I'm giving them a movement. Now, if I've missed a sheath issue, I'm going to irritate them because that's their provocative load. Exactly, so yes. That's why it's so important. If we treated them all the same, it wouldn't matter. So understanding tendon load is critical in your diagnosis, but it also really sets us up for your next question, which was how we use those different types of load. Um, does that make sense? Absolutely, yes. 
cool. Okay, so then we can consider the different ways we might load a tendon. So we can load or load a muscle, actually. We can load it isometrically. We can load it concentrically, eccentrically, or we can combine concentric and eccentric and do, um, you know, what we call isotonic, which I'm sure everyone's familiar with. Now, that's our that's our early stage um, rehabilitation. And then we obviously need to add in our faster movements because that's what our tendons need to do. But let's just talk about the, the first stage to begin with. So the key thing for me is listening to the person, listening to the loads that aggravate them because they're the loads you need to remove, they're your provocative loads, and keeping in as much other wonderful load as you can. So if we talk about the patella tendon, we've done um, some research looking at isometric or static load, and we've done some research looking at isotonic load. And both are really well tolerated in the patella tendon, which is fantastic. And also... If you're sitting there thinking about it, that makes sense because it's not compressive and it's not fast. And there's pretty much no, um, no peritendon in the patella tendon. So what we're doing is a really safe load. So if you have someone with anterior knee pain or patella tendinopathy, they should be very comfortable doing an isometric or an isotonic. So if I think really pragmatically, if I put someone on a heavy leg extension machine and they have increasing pain that radiates all the way around their, their patella, m my instinct is I don't think they have patella tendinopathy. I think they have patellofemoral pain. Yes. And again, that's why it matters because I wouldn't give that person heavy isometric or heavy concentric eccentric. I would work out my way in for that person and I would consider that to be a differential diagnosis. So for tendons, isometric load is super safe. Isotonic load is super safe because they're static and slow. So if you have a patient that's aggravated by those, I would really look at my differential diagnosis. So it becomes a bit of a circular argument for us because load is so critical in the patient presentation that if someone's then aggravated by that load, we would go so far as to say, look, look at some other cause of their pain. So do you ever take into consideration biomechanics? Like, you know, when I typically treat Achilles tendonitis or tendinopathy, I'm more apt to put somebody into an orthotic to stabilize the heel and keep it in neutral so that it doesn't go into eversion and inversion so much um, because it seems like the the tendon bowing side to side is is more irritating than a linear pull on the tendon. Um, so we used to put heel lifts under everybody with Achilles tendon issues, but I found much more benefit from doing an orthotic and stabilizing the heel or the patella tendon uh, with somebody who has a really high Q angle. They seem to have more patella tendon discomfort than those who have a really well aligned um, patella. D are, are biomechanics a, a big factor when trying to manage uh, these tendinopathy issues and, and to add load to it? Would you correct the biomechanics and then add the load is what I'm saying. Yeah, that's such a great question. And I think um, I think we can answer it a couple of ways. If you look at a, a population level, if you look at the, the research, the research, um, I think a lot of the subtleties get washed out compared to what we see in clinical practice. So at a at a at a group level, what we would say is the the evidence for orthotics in the Achilles. Um, so Shannon Muntinu and colleagues at Latrobe basically found that a sham orthotic was similar to a custom made orthotic in terms of their effect, and so the exercise overwhelmed the um, the effect of the orthotic. But um, I know a lot of clinicians could give countless stories of when they've found it really has helped. So what I want people to, to understand is that evidence-based practice is not using a recipe. So what I don't want people to ever do is say everyone needs an orthotic or no one needs an orthotic because the answer lies in our clinical reasoning for the person in front of us. So um, my, my personal approach is that we tend to try and address our strength deficits and then see what we're left with in terms of the mechanics. So often we see... Um, we see 
you know, what we might consider to be sort of suboptimal, you know, biomechanics, but sometimes people are just using what they've got. So they might have really, really poor um, calf strength and foot intrinsics and all of those things. And again, that's why it's lost in research because people will come into the study at completely different functional levels and have completely different goals. So it's far more challenging for the clinician, but also you have greater scope to be so individualised. So I think um, the answer is somewhere in the middle. I think you treat the person in front of you. My preferences tend to go um, strength first and then look at what I have left. And if I need to retrain, running retraining or something, I'll refer them onto a specialist. But I know that... Um, and. Christian Barton's work is mainly in patellofemoral. I know that he um, thinks the opposite. He does biomechanics first and then sort of strength. So I think there's more than one way to skin a cat, actually. That's what I think. Well, I am so excited that you just said that because, you know, I, I've been at this for 26 years and I've looked at a lot of research and I think research is absolutely invaluable. It really helps to drive us. I know that doing treatment now with patients with tendinopathy is definitely different than it was five, 10 years ago. Um, it's completely changed and our, and our thought process is, is changing. We're seeing insurance companies looking at, you know, physiotherapy as the number one way to start treating all these orthopedic and musculoskeletal conditions rather than just jump into surgery and try to manage them and get a quick treatment for it. So it seems like, you know, we, we are finally coming around. But what I've also found is that there is something to be said about experience, about working with not just hundreds, but thousands of patients with a particular diagnosis. And instead of just throwing them into one big tub of, you know, a diagnosis, a one diagnosis, it, it's, it's, you know, everybody's different. Everybody's put together differently. They all respond differently. They all have a different amount of grit. Um, and, uh, you know, people, uh, maybe smokers, non-smokers and whatnot. So there's so many variables in there um, that I think experience on top of the evidence um, can really help drive how you treat your patient. Um, and I'm so glad you mentioned that. You bet. And, and similarly, you know, patient expectations, you know, the, the original um, evidence-based practice was made up of all of those things that I, I think we forget that. I think people think that the, the bit of paper, you know, the research, and, and obviously I defend research it's a big part of my job but I think um, we don't do a good enough job of teasing out the the responders non-responders the subtleties in research whereas the clinician has to you, you can't you can't give a recipe because someone might have you know helix rigidus you might have something else in that person's presentation they might have diabetes that is really important in how you manage them Absolutely. Thank you for adding that. So uh, we've got a couple more questions for you, but um, before we continue, I'd like to uh, just take a few uh, moments to hear another word from our sponsor. Be right back. Welcome back, everybody. And um, so uh, this has been a great episode so far. I have a couple more questions for you, Ebony. I know you are super, super busy, and I really appreciate you taking the time to uh, to meet with us today and to uh, to chat and to give us all of this great knowledge because I know you work so so hard um, with in regards to tendinopathy and neuroplasticity, and um, your goal is to really help you know, people and, and your, your name is becoming world renowned. And uh, this is absolutely awesome. So I really appreciate you coming on. I'm going to, um, I'm going to send a few more questions your way and see if you can help us out as far as, you know, now we, we've, we've got a good understanding of tendinopathy. How can we utilize this in the clinic a little bit? If, you know, are there any brief pearls in regards to protocols? You know, how long do you hold an isometric hold? Um, how often do you do it? Do you do it several times a day? Do you do it just once a day? Do you do it every other day? Um, if you were to choose a couple different tendinopathy issues, how would you address them in the clinic if you were to give some sort of a quote unquote, air quote, protocol? Okay, fantastic. The first thing I would do is you have to nail your diagnoses. So my first clinical tip is your tendon pain patient, your patient with tendinopathy needs to report uh, localized pain with high tendon load for that tendon. So if we're thinking the Achilles, um, it can be these of the lifespan. You can have your mid-portion Achilles tendinopathy, which is two fingers. You can have your insertion 
down usually on the lateral side. You know, they can report things like running and jogging, but you need to use your spring, your Achilles spring throughout your life, even to change direction or walk downstairs. So you can see Achilles tendinopathy throughout the lifespan. If you're thinking patella tendon, where's your pain? Inferior pole, one finger, doesn't move or spread. Aggravated by high tendon load. So you're thinking jumping, you're thinking fast change of direction, but not running and not cycling. So what doesn't aggravate them is as helpful. So if we um, just, yeah, where's your pain and what aggravates your pain? They're my, that's my first clinical tip is get your diagnosis right. Really listen to your patient because a lot of things will aggravate multiple diagnoses. For example, um, you know, lunging and the decline squat aggravates patellofemoral pain as much as patella tendinopathy. It's not diagnostic. You have to ask them where their pain is. Um, and the Achilles can be really complex because I think you can have probably nine differential diagnoses down there and some of them can coexist. So you can see some sural nerve irritation. You can see some superficial bursa. Um, so in terms of uh, my first tip is get your diagnosis right. And then if we're thinking, what might we do with this person? Well, you've asked them what load aggravates them. So that gives you a really nice start point of the load you would try. So I would say to people, you could try some isometric or some isotonic. And if people do uh, get pain relief, if they get analgesia, they, they're often highly adherent. I think when patients are non-adherent, we need to really consider um, what we've given them. And so I think we can really promote adherence by giving people these tools that promote self-efficacy. So what I would do if I was going to try an isometric is I would try it in the clinic because it gives me immediate feedback as to whether or not it's going to be helpful for that person. Is that my start point? And for the patella tendon, I spent 18 months piloting um, the protocol for that study. And what I found is if you do a super, super heavy load, so over 80, 90, 100%, you can't hold it for very long. And so you don't really get um, any analgesia. If you do a very low level, so 10, 20, 30, um, you can hold it for a very long time and you don't get analgesia. So I piloted these different combinations of time under tension and load. I don't think we have a recipe. I don't think we necessarily know that five by 45 is um, anything magical. It was helpful in our research and we've replicated that now a number of times. So the important thing to think about then as a clinician is if it has to be heavy and heavy for the person, um, I need to think about the angle at which I can generate the most force. So, for example, we did a 60 degrees of knee extension because that's where you can generate the most force, and we did 70% at 60 degrees. So it's super heavy. But if you change the angle and do it at 30 degrees and you're doing 70% of the force you can generate at that level, then you're automatically changing um, your MVC and therefore the force that the tendon sees. And I think the load's quite important. The reason why I think that is there's some great research in um, the lateral elbow, which does work into wrist extension, and you can't generate nearly as much force into wrist extension as you can into supination. So we tend to load our lateral elbows in supination, actually, um, or in pronation. So my first tip would be for loading and your start point is you could try an isometric or an isotonic because they are both super safe loads for your tendons. Reassure people. If people are frightened of load, it's a great opportunity to educate them that your tendons and your muscles love these types of load. We look for, um, if I'm in the lab, it's easy, you measure it. In the clinic, I'm looking for a load that's heavy. I'm looking for a load that they're really challenged up around 45 seconds. But if they can only make... 20 seconds or so and they're getting a lot of muscle fasciculation or they're getting a lot of bounce, I need to drop my load. So I look for something that's heavy for that person, but that they can sustain it. So I literally say to people, um, you know, is that too easy? Could you hold it all day? And if it's too easy, you have to go up. They'll soon tell you if it's too hard. So you might spend 30 seconds getting your load right. We isolate it as best we can because tendons are sneaky. They will hide in the kinetic chain. So we would use a leg extension for our patella tendons because a leg press or a wall sit, you can distribute the load. And again, people just don't get the analgesia. And if it's not helpful, they they won't do it. So I had a um, an elite football player in Australia that I was asked to see and he'd been given 
15 second double leg calf holds for his Achilles in the shower. Now I'm not sure why it was in the shower, but um, it was double leg. It was 15 seconds. He, and I said to him, did it help? No. Are you doing them? No. Now, his analgesic um, level was actually in a Smith rack, single leg with 60 kilos on the bar at oh. ankle dorsiflexion, but it, it took away his hot pain. So don't be scared of static load and don't be scared of isometric load. They're both really safe. In terms of how we would apply the isotonic, we use a slightly longer eccentric phase. That's really good for the brain, actually. That engages your motor, your frontal lobe, because you've really got to you've got to plan it. So, for a big muscle group like our quads, we would do three seconds concentric, four seconds eccentric. Great opportunity to use your metronome. It guarantees your time under tension, um, which is really important. People often go through these far quicker than you'd like, but also that that external pacing actually helps um, with your excitability that helps with your drive um, to the muscle so um, I would advocate single leg where possible um, because tendons are sneaky we'd only go to double leg if someone's been so unloaded that um, we need to start there if they'd been in a cam boot or something like that Right, right. I'm, I'm really glad you mentioned uh, the metronome because as I was listening to some of your uh, other um, uh, YouTube videos uh, earlier, I started changing my workouts a little bit and not listening to music that didn't have much beat. So I tried, you know, a couple different things. So I'd listen to some music that was kind of, you know, out there and um, it was very difficult to really keep a good contraction. Um, and I didn't really realize it that I started listening to you and then I tried it. Then I just put the music away and I was alone and it was quiet and I just took my time. Um, and the workout was just so much better. And I think that's very important that you can really tune into that and contract it. And I had a patient the other day who came in with an Achilles uh, tendinopathy, had it over a year and we did load him kind of like the program you just talked about. And it was amazing. He came in the next visit and it was the one thing that we changed in his treatment protocol that made the biggest difference. Um, and I, it really, at that point, it really sold it for me and it sold it for the patient also as, and he was, he was thinking about it like, you know, this is not going to help me. We're going to be loading this thing. That's all irritated. Um, but, uh, it was pretty impressive. And I, and I think really people should be looking at this kind of program a little bit more. Um, so while we're on this, this, um, uh, you know, story of uh, tendinopathy. Let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, poking and prodding. And, you know, we talk about diagnosing these things and oftentimes palpation is part of this. And what I find is that people poke too much uh, on a tendon. They cause an irritation, just like an Achilles tendon or a retrocalcaneal bursitis that is being irritated by somebody who is kicking their shoe off with their other foot and driving their foot into the shoe without unlacing it. And it causes a, a mechanical irritation back there. Um, what are your thoughts about things like, you know, palpating it and poking and prodding the tendon? Do you think that that has an effect on how the tendon responds and, and um, works? You have the best questions. I, I completely agree with you. So the first thing to say about palpation is it's really sensitive. Lots of bits will hurt. So in the front of the knee, the patella tendon is one of the most sensitive structures in knee osteoarthritis, but I'm not recruiting for a study in a nursing home. So the problem with palpation is it's not specific. Lots of bits will hurt. The And as you said, with the Achilles, you know, you, you can squeeze an Achilles in people with um, no clinical presentation of, of tendon pain. And, you know, it can often be irritating because that it's a sensitive structure. So the problem with palpation is it actually doesn't help you rule tendinopathy in. OK, it doesn't help you rule it in. And. I often get this question next, does it help you rule it out if it's not sore? And no one's really looked at the negative sort of specificity around that. But what I would say is, do we put our hands on patients? Absolutely. If someone has a knee joint effusion, I'm not thinking patella tendinopathy because it's extra articular. So do we use our manual skills? You bet. Do we squeeze or poke the tendon? No, it adds nothing. If someone has load-related localised pain and they're giving me a tendon history, I'm sold. If someone gets pain 
cycling and you know all these other non-tendon things i don't care if that bit hurts to poke it's not helpful so it's not helpful in diagnosis actually the second thing to say is it's not helpful in prognosis if something's really tender it gives us no concept of how long that's going to take um it is i tell people it's the last thing to get better and i tell them to stop poking it because all it does as you said is it's a mechanical irritation it just keeps it a bit sensitive so the guys that sit there and they poke at their patella tendon the whole way through the consult it's not helpful the final thing i'll say is i was part of a fantastic international um consensus and i feel really strongly that in research we often don't describe who's in our studies very well so we often poke it and say it's sore and then we often do imaging and say they've got pathology and we know you can have asymptomatic pathology and we know that tendons can hurt to poke and you can have another diagnosis so I've, I've, I'm doing some research at the moment looking at whether or not that correlates with their load related pain and it doesn't and in this international consensus palpation was not voted in as being um, important in uh, what to report, um, which I think is pretty powerful. So this was the world-leading tendon experts and we also asked um, patients and palpation um, didn't make it. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. And I'm so glad you mentioned that. You know, how often have we seen patients with plantar fasciitis that you treat and, um, you know, after three weeks, they, they can get up in the morning. They don't have that morning pain anymore. They can go for a run. They can walk all day long, but they poke it and they say, well, it still hurts. And there are tissues in your body that, that hurt. And, and if anybody is listening to this podcast, I want you to do this. I want you to bend over. I want you to take your index finger and your thumb, and I want you to take your Achilles tendon, and I want you to squeeze it from medial to lateral. Okay. Yeah. And if anybody thinks that's comfortable, I want you to send me an email. Okay. And let me know. <laughs> It is, it's, it's painful on almost everybody. Um, so we need to make sure that we just don't use that as the tool to identify how people are doing, um, what their diagnosis is and what their prognosis is. And I totally agree with you on that one. Um, here's a tough one. I'm not going to keep you much longer. As far as treatment of these tendon issues, there are so many different treatments out there. There's taping, there's dry needling, there's uh, IA stem, there's all kinds of things. What are your thoughts about, you know, soft tissue work like uh, IA stem, like, uh, you know, instrument assisted soft tissue mobilization or Graston technique or uh, dry needling and things of that sort to treat these problems? I think that any adjunctive treatment that enables people to do their load, that doesn't cost people a disgusting amount of money, that doesn't cause um, reliance on the clinician and that doesn't aggravate the tendon are okay. So if we look at what that leaves us, that leaves us some um, opportunity to change um, how people feel with some massage over the muscle or dry needling over the muscle. We don't massage the tendon that Graston implement makes me go pale over the tendon um you know expensive injections into tendons um like the blood products cannot be justified um you know from on the back of research um so and the the main problem with all of them and and this is probably a really great question to finish on is that none of them actually address the problems that the patient has so the patient has um, pain. Well, PRP, for example, does nothing for pain. The patient has, um, you know, as an example, dysfunction in their calf and their quad and their kinetic chain. And the PRP does nothing about their strength, their strength endurance, their ability of the tendon to work like a spring. Um, so when people are coming to you with problems of pain and dysfunction, that's what we should be treating and the best evidence for managing both of those actually is exercise for both pain and dysfunction so exercise has great effects um uh, immediately for some people but certainly in terms of the long game and that's what we're asking people to play with tendinopathies the long game there's no magic bullet so if someone needs some um some mobilization or some massage that helps them do their gym program i'm totally okay with it as long as it enables them to do load you know similar people say oh what do you think of patella tendon tape if someone loves it 
knock yourself out. That's fine. I think it's it's low risk. You're not asking the person to spend a lot of money and you're not aggravating the tendon. Right. Um, Ebony, all this information has been absolutely invaluable and I really appreciate you helping us out with this. Um, now, is there anything that we've missed? Is there anything you'd like to throw out there in regards to tendinopathy that you think we should know that we haven't already talked about? Oh, that's such a great question. Um, I want every single person listening to this to really delve into the next piece of research they read and I want them to decide for themselves whether or not there's enough information in the paper to apply it to the person in front of them. So a really good example of this is eccentrics. So eccentrics um, were like the, the research is fantastic because it reminded us or it taught us that active therapy is better than passive therapy. So eccentrics really gave us a great start point to load. The problem that we have is rolling out um, any treatment that it's going to be comprehensive enough for everyone. And isometrics are the same. You can't stop at isometrics. You'd, you'd be mad. You've not restored anything. They're a start point. But the problem with rolling out something like eccentrics is we see that they made people with insertional Achilles tendinopathy worse because of the compression. There's poor evidence if you're a woman. Well, that's a problem for 50% of the population or so. Worse prognosis if you have a high BMI. Again, a lot of our patients have these comorbidities like diabetes and, and high BMI. Um, they make you worse in season. Again, that's a problem because that's a lot of when our tendon problems um, arise. So this is not bagging eccentrics. What I want to do is use it as a tool so that the next time you read research, you think, is that person um, similar to my patient in terms of um, their start point, their physical activity level, their gender, if it's important? Have they reported comorbidities? Because my patient is 30 kilos overweight and has diabetes. Um, what, what was their end point? The end point in research is usually a period of time. You know, we look at something for four weeks. As clinicians, that person is, is with us until we have the privilege of hopefully making them much more functional. So um, really look at research, really critique it, and um, be, be critical of, of what we do because that's we should be held accountable. But please don't just read the abstract and rule something in or out without really appreciating who they've included. Absolutely. Well, Ebony, this has been a great show. Um, if people had questions for you, um, how would they get in touch with you if that's okay? I mean, if, if you're okay with people connecting or if they had a question, is there any particular way that you'd prefer to be contacted? Yeah, of course. So um, I'm actually no longer on Twitter at all. So um, I'm sorry if people have tried to contact me on Twitter. I'm always happy for an email. People email me all the time and it's totally fine. Um, I'll always get back to you. I can be a little bit slow, but I promise I will always reply. And so that's just at my Latrobe Uni um, account. So I can email that to you or people can look it up. It's pretty easy to find, but um, that's totally fine if people have questions. All right, great. Well, thank you so much, Ebony. Uh, we'll take your uh, email. We'll put it in our show notes today. And um, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to contact me at uh, orthoevalpal.com. Just go to my Get In Touch page and I'd be more than happy to uh, get back to you. I've been trying to uh, get back to folks as soon as possible. We've had some great questions lately and some great comments. And I really appreciate you all watching the show. And again, Ebony, thank you so much for your time and your expertise. And um, I'm sure I know I will be continuing to follow your research uh, when it comes out and as you do more. And uh, I'm sure the folks listening to the show will do the same thing. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's been fun. All right, everybody. Thank you so much. And uh, make sure you stay tuned for the next episode. Take care.